Hey, Cypher here, and today I want to talk about periodization. So periodization is the way that we contain a story or a history. You often hear it talking about like the age of something, like the Gilded Age, which is normally considered like the late 19th century to the Progressive Era. And the whole point of a periodization is that it has a beginning, middle, and end, as in a story. And you'll find that pretty much any history book you read relies on these kinds of periodization. But it is ultimately an artificial divide. I mean, think about it. What is the difference between the Gilded Age and the Progressive Era? It certainly isn't some definitive event. Normally it's divided around 1898, as in like the Spanish-American War, but uh, that's a pretty artificial divide. So the Gilded Age is a name that Mark Twain gave to the era. It's supposed to reflect how like laissez-faire capitalism kind of ran amok and while a few elite managed to gain ridiculous amounts of wealth, as in the robber barons, the rest of the people suffered as a result. And it was also an age of rampant corruption, and so the progressives wanted to reform the system. And so when they started to reform things, that is the difference between the Gilded and Progressive Age. The difference in time being somewhere during McKinley's administration and somewhere during Teddy Roosevelt's administration. So perhaps the assassination of McKinley is the dividing line. But the problem with that kind of periodization is that, for instance, the Sherman Antitrust Act was passed in 1890. That is often considered a progressive era reform, but if that's progressive era, that's bleeding into the Gilded Age. And so there is no neat divide between the two. And the same goes for the beginning of the Gilded Age, because there's no real good line for that either. People will often say that it starts in 1877 with the end of Reconstruction, but you can't really talk about the Gilded Age without talking about the Grant administration during the 1870s. So sometimes people will put it at the end of the Civil War, but that puts you during the time of Reconstruction. So there's no clear dividing line even with that. And you can see that pretty much any way that we try to divide up eras are going to have these kinds of problems. They always do. But it's kind of a narrative necessity. After all, history is the story of us, and so it's always going to conform to some sort of narrative conceit. You're going to have a beginning, middle, and end to basically everything. Oftentimes, historians will divide up chapters and make each chapter its own era or something like that. You see that a lot with textbooks, for instance. It makes stories fairly neat, and Unfortunately, it also adds some falsehood. By making these artificial divides, we are claiming that there's some sort of zeitgeist or spirit of the age that is ruling this periodization, that each era has something unique to it, and that that uniqueness is the story. So you can see how it's kind of unavoidable, but it also has this problem of making things seem like they end or begin at some specific point when history isn't that clear. It also kind of buries the lead, as in when you make these kinds of periodizations, it's not clear what the argument is being made sometimes, and if you're not making that argument clear, then you're not being a good historian. So obviously there's ways of getting around it by emphasizing that all periodizations are fuzzy and that it's ultimately an artificial divide, but we kind of can't avoid it, can we? Pretty much anything you've ever been taught in history relies on some sort of periodization. I mean, look at my California history series. Each one of those is kind of a periodization. I will go backwards and forwards as much as the narrative requires, but ultimately, I am dividing up chunks of time by theme. And I think thematic history is probably the best way to avoid these problems, but there are a number of other types of periodization that imply a very particular narrative. 
Now the first and probably most common type of periodization is one of inevitable progress. As in, history keeps on marching and inevitably progresses to be better and better and better. You see this a lot with nationalist histories where the nation state is the inevitable outcome of a supposed nation, even though in reality that nation probably didn't exist until the nation state. The direct opposite of that is the declensionist narrative, as in one in which you have a discrete period of time that was kind of cool, but it went away. You see that a lot with anything having to do with American Indians. So a perfect example of this is the monumental work of Richard White with Middle Ground. The Middle Ground postulates that there is this particular era of time in which French and then later British people ended up interacting with people in the Ohio Valley area and specifically the Western Ohio Valley area and created a, well, Middle Ground of sorts where essentially no one had discrete hegemony. While the Allfather, as in what local Indians called colonial powers, had some sort of discretionary power over them, they also had discretionary power over the Allfather, as in they could control the policies of empires. But how that middle ground falls apart is that eventually the Americans come in and come to dominate the space, and there's no longer a middle ground if somebody imposes dominance. So the idea of a declensionist narrative is that it is really good for a little bit, and then it goes down. A third type of periodization is origins. You often see histories that are like the origin of something, or first. Now, I've talked a lot about how first is kind of a thing that bugs historians. You'll see a lot of people saying that superlatives are something that historians should avoid. Only a Sith deals in absolutes. But sometimes we kind of just can't help it. I mean, it's just a good narrative conceit that here is the origin of something. Let's see how it develops from that origin. But as I said many a time before, there's nothing new under the sun. Everything in terms of invention and change isn't some big new thing, it's always rooted in history. But ultimately, it makes a pretty good narrative conceit if you have something as origin or someone. You know, this guy was the first to do that, and therefore it changed everything. That's not a good way of looking at history, but ultimately it's a fun way of doing it. And the fourth and final one is, of course, thematic history, as in you focus on a theme and see where that develops. I think that this is the best way to avoid the problems of periodization, but also it means that you're kind of going back and forth without any clear time frame. It's not like it's just an inevitable march of time. But inevitability is kind of one of the key problems with periodization. It makes history overdetermined. Now at some point I'm probably going to make a diatribe about overdetermination, but to put it simply, overdetermination neglects contingency and thinks that history is inevitable, that whatever happened could only have happened, that there were no other possibilities whatsoever. But one of the things that alternate history is really good at is showing the contingency of history, that small little details could change everything. But that's what a lot of these periodizations do. They overdetermine things to the point that there is no contingency. There's no other way that it could have happened. Of course, alternate history also has its own overdetermination problems, but we won't get into that here. But then you can swing completely to the other end and make it too much about agency that if you have characters who have too much agency, then you neglect how everything else is affecting them. Now, I've already made a diatribe about agency previously, so I don't have to go into it too much here. Just click on that and uh, go see that. But one of the key things is that makes it too much about particular people, that great men change history and no one else. But both overdetermination and 
over agency, I guess we could call it, are things that we don't experience. Remember, history is the story of us. It's about us. We experience history. So one of the ideas that I've seen floating around is that history shouldn't have a narrative. And I really don't understand that. I, I have no idea what that means. Like, there's this idea of big history where you have, like, history starting with the Big Bang, but they don't really have a story to tell, true, but all they do is talk about periodization. Literally, their entire thing is trying to periodize stuff so that other people can tell stories. They're not particularly good at telling stories, but they're trying to make it possible for others to do it. I'm not a big fan of big history, by the way. I think it's crap, but you can see where they're getting at, that they're trying to make things about periodization. And the best periodization is the best story that you can tell. Of course, you can't really tell stories without primary sources, and so there's no primary sources about the Big Bang. There's no primary sources about dinosaurs or prehistoric humans. That just makes no sense. But you can see how periodization ultimately hinders history while also bolstering it. It's integral, but a problem. You have four types of periodization. Progression, declension, origin, and theme. Each of these imply their own problems. But history without narrative really isn't history. It's just a litany of facts given in a sequence. Which, that's not a story. That's not history. That's a chronicle. Basically, if you look at a timeline, if you look at anything which is just like a list of facts, those are chronicles. Historians aren't chroniclers. But in order to tell a story, we ultimately can't help but periodize. So we have to navigate these things. The way that thematic history kind of avoids a lot of these things is by making the story about a particular idea or object. Or in the case of my California series, the most recent one was about trains and oil. So I just told the story of trains and oil. But that also means that I'm kind of going back and forth in time with no clear progression, declension, or origin. Thematic history is muddled, but I think it's the best way to avoid the problem of periodization. It still has its own problems, but at least to me, that's kind of the best. But tell me what you think. Do you think that there are ways of getting around this problem of periodization? Or am I overthinking it? I'll see you next time. Wow. Wow. Hey, no!